Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming on time to the first talk of the day. Um, I'm Adam Florin. That's my handle up teeny teeny up in the uh, upper right. Um, I do creative technology of a few varieties, uh, some of it music, some of it graphics. Um, in the past, I've worked a bunch on experiential installations for brands and organizations and uh, creative tools as well, um, which is more uh, to the point. Um, the original name for this talk was the formalist industrial complex, and I will hit on some of the themes in that, but maybe less of the industrial ones, because I really want to walk, go through in a little more detail uh, a specific project. Um, so this is Patter. Can I see a show of hands? Do people in the room know Patter? Has anybody seen this? Okay, there's some folks, all right. So um, it's a device for Ableton Live, um, which is a music performance platform. Um, and it's, uh, for, it's a generative sequencer for making music from nothing, from random chance operations and systems. And it's really about kind of making rule-based music. Um, it's not data-driven or AI-driven or any of that. A lot of the core work I did in grad school at CalArts in 2010, 2011, kind of before the, the heat of the current AI moment. Um, but it, it, I do, you know, kind of dove down some interesting rabbit holes while thinking of what would a generative, an organic bottom-up generative form look like, as opposed to a lot of the existing top-down forms, which kind of presumed that you wanted 4-4 four, four time or chord progressions. I was like, I don't want regular meter. I don't want chord progressions. I want to just plant a little seed of music and see it kind of expand from there. So um, first, I'm going to show just the video pattern, because that sells it probably better than I could do. It was all kind of automated and basically it's showing off some of the basic controls which are based on um, graph distribution and some of the ways that forms are produced but one thing you can see is that when it's uh, generating notes in the little window it never generates more than one or two at a time and a really essential part of the project for me was kind of modeling the mind of an improviser You're not modeling 60 seconds of music at a time or an hour of music at a time but just really what are the next two to three seconds or half a second and take it from there so it's this feedback loop much like in actual like free improvisation, you know, you're mainly just sitting there listening and, and thinking of what to do next. Um, so I'll stop this, figure out how to get back to that. This is requiring more mouse work, sorry, thanks for your patience. No, don't do that. Okay. Um, and yeah, just making a, music a few notes at a time. Um, and kind of also just based on like what can a computer do that a human can't? Like how does that actually end up changing our um, perception of rhythm um, and all of that? So um, it's out there in the wild, it's getting used. I don't know if Aaron, Aaron Soloway, are you here? No. Hey, what's up? Um, so I got you, Aaron used it in this project as this really fun thing that premiered at Moogfest, Beach Ball Synth, where people could hit these giant balls and they'd control the parameters of a generative music system and patterns somewhere there under the hood. Um, and there's a community using it to make, I've heard it used for video game soundtracks, there's some Irish uh, uh, indie label electronic music that uses it, and um, it's fun stuff. So to drill into kind of like my, to restate kind of my motivations when thinking about this, rather than like the supercomputer system that, that plows through 80 gigabytes of data, um, this quote came out after I was working on it, but it really captures kind of my attitude. Um, and this is Paul Ford saying, Oh, I have it there. You, using a pen and paper, can do anything a computer can. You just can't do those things billions of times per second. Um, and what I like that is it captures nicely the idea of like, this computer tools and all this AI and algorithmic stuff can be really rooted in human ideas of rule-based systems and logic and all of that. Um, so, and there are various ways once you, once you, when you're working with instructions, instruction-based art, when you create the instruction, you can have a computer execute it or you can have humans execute it. So I also think of, I mean, speaking of the pencil and paper metaphor, it's quite apt. Um, Saul Lewitt's work, the instruction-based works where there's a team of human executants um, who deal with it. <laughs> Which is, you know, we can be computers too, that's cool. Um, so, while I was kind of wrestling with these ideas and thinking of like what kind of a system I wanted to make when I'm 
in grad school, in the music program, um, and thinking of my val uh, what, what, what my values were there. I, I had, happened to have a course requirement in um, medieval and renaissance music, which I wasn't very excited about because I was there to make software art. Um, but I had to do it, and it actually ended up cracking open a way of thinking about music that was really interesting for me. Um, so what we're looking at here, this is from nine, the year 926, so not even last millennium at this point. Um, this is a codex of some of the earliest Western music notation, or European music notation, rather, um, that shows, you can kind of see the alleluias and the other words, but it's very text-based. Basically, the text of the center, it's a piece to be sung, it's monophonic, and the pitches, this is just a shorthand, basically, to remember, like, yeah, the, the pitches are supposed to go here and there, and this was kind of just, apparently, the story is that Charlemagne wanted his court singers to do the same thing twice, so they had to figure out a way to write down what they were doing. Um, but really, the text is the center. There's nothing like modern notions of rhythm, and, and that's what kind of I really started getting excited about, is like, this doesn't look at all like what music looks like today. It's not, like, metered out, and it's just, it kind of emerges. It's emergent from the text. Um, then a couple hundred years later, I, I couldn't find an exact date for this sample, but this is probably around 1100 something, 12th century. Um, you see um, this notation style, the old one and this one are both called neumes, N-E-U-M-E-S. Um, and these are square neumes, and you can see by now somebody's figured out, we gotta remember the pitches also. We have to put staff, the horizontal lines, so we can remember the pitches, and these little block-based things, and they make kind of, they're a little like beautiful ink calligraphy um, where each of those little clusters kind of represents a specific rhythm, um, this little rhythmic pattern. And the thinking of the day was really still just rhythm. If you think about rhythm, it emerges from language. There are the standard feet of poetic meter. There's I am, trochee, spondy, dactyl, all these standard things, which are combinations of strong and weak beats in, in groups of two or three. Um, and that's still how rhythm was considered. So these, one of these clusters might be kind of trochaic and one might be I'm using these terms, I don't know, everybody knows iambic pentameter in English. Um, <laughs> that's, that's it, iambic pentameter is five iams. Anyway, um, it's kind of a really interesting way of thinking about rhythm that, you know, on some level it really boils down to just like how you talk. Um, oops, contrast that to, you know, what we're used to seeing music look like. I think this is Brahms' first symphony, definitely is. Um, where, you know, the first thing you see is the jarring grid lines. It's like measure, divide, conquer. <laughs> like, and everything must be totally uniform. Brr, like, that's what we love in the modern age. Like, everything's gotta be on a grid. If it's not on a grid, it doesn't exist. Um, but a funny thing happens in the 20th century um, that there's a kind of concept of gestalt principles um, that we kind of start focusing more on the perceptual end of how we receive this information, whether it's um, graphics or music. Um, and so this is an example, you know, you see the cube, but there isn't actually a cube there, it's actually just dots with holes in them. Um, but people start applying the idea of gestalt principles to musical perception of how do we perceive groupings, that, you know, the groupings on the page might be like, just it's a bunch of notes on a grid, but you hear it as little, group of four, and that group of four might contain two notes, and um, one of the really interesting thinkers in the 80s, well, this is James Tenney, who I never met before he died, but he was a big CalArts person, so his, his fingerprints were kind of on everything, but um, his doctoral thesis was called Metahodos, and he um, really explored this idea of like how do we perceive the groupings of sound events, and his concern was 20th century music, which is, you know, just experimental, out there, avant-garde music is usually what that term refers to. Um, and he applied the gestalt thinking to kind of come up with this idea of, he described it as a phenomenology of 20th century music. Um, and this kind of starts pointing back to these little like organic clusters that emerge, this time not in the intention of the speaker, or the musician, but in the, in the ear of the listener. Um, and then people run even further with that in the 80s, applying kind of Chomsky and uh, generative grammars to music, and this is from Lairdahl and Jackendoff, I forget their first names, but generative theory of total music where you're breaking down huge sections and saying like, okay, these are little, all little groups of two and three notes or two and three little rhythm, rhythmic units and they cluster and that makes a rhythmic unit and the clusters and this, this hierarchical structure kind of emerges and that's actually what we're hearing when we're listening to music and this stuff goes really deep. But it really starts to kind of lead back to this idea of, okay, everything's just a combination of strong and weak beats that's rooted in language. It's not really about the grid actually, it's about how, how you feel um, and how it, so it, 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 it points to this way that like, what's, so, what's been so fun for me of looking at pre-modern ideas is that when you mine the pre-modern, it really kind of informs 
I'm using this term very, very loosely, but postmodern ways of thinking, like basically ways of thinking that are not rooted in like modernist, rationalized, all that stuff. So the place that I landed on, <laughs> I'm still making software, so it does have to be rationalized, lol. Um, oh, it's, it's a little, it's too faint to really see this very well, but um, uh, basically the idea is I came up with an idea of like a segment, and a segment is one to four notes, and they're all in the same rhythm, and they can be stacked to get added together in time so that you can play one and play another and another and another and they'll all be different kind of lengths and durations and kind of make this organic um, music that never really adheres to a strict um, meter of any sort. And uh, that's, that's basically what's, what's running in pattern. Um, but the next question ends up being, uh, how do you, like what, what is the system, so given that we have this sort of uh, uh, the elastic framework um, to present rhythms in, what about the random part? What about the generativity part? What are the sorts of like sources, inputs that drive all of that? Um, and I really love these images. This is from a book uh, called On Growth and Form um, by Darcy Wentworth Thompson, who's a, I guess a kind of a polymath biologist mathematician um, in the early 20th century. And he kind of looked at um, species growing patterns and how they can be mapped to the, you know, conceptually mathematical surfaces that could be distorted. And I, I just, I love this idea of like, all the little pieces of music are gonna be like little creatures and they, they grow according to these sorts of structures. It can be permutated. Um, you kind of break down like this form into, into like a graph and permutate each angle. Um, and there are other kinds of places to look to nature um, for random, so that, that, that's kind of a, a comment on altering the form, but in terms of what the random input is, um, there are ways to look to nature. Um, does anybody know this sculpture? Yeah, some people know. So this is in South San Francisco. It's an Aeolian harp, which is an um, instrument that's played by the wind. Um, so this is, you know, wind chimes and Aeolian harps are really the original generative music um, because they, it's, it's, it's true randomness. It's you're, sampling, you're sampling a natural phenomenon and running it through a human system um, of, of meaning. Um, and I, I have never been, actually. I've known about this for years, and it's, on, it's been on my to-do list, and maybe, maybe today. Um, or tomorrow. Um, there are other kind of versions of um, taking music from natural sources. This is a project called Midi Sprout by uh, Data Garden. They did this, they kickstarted this, and they've really made like a little business out of it. But the principle is you get that little box and you attach the little nodes to a plant and it captures a, it's a bio data sonification device. I think it outputs Midi. Um, I don't know what, how, what the mapping is and I think it's intentionally vague and they even have a project called plants.fm which is radio that's continuously um, <laughs> performed by plants. <laughs> I think it's a really funny conceit, and I, I love this picture. Um, so those are natural sources of input, but you know, when I was conceiving of my project, I wasn't gonna have a hardware requirement where you have to have like a, I don't know, wind sensor or something. Um, so that leaves me with, you know, computer random tools. Um, and going back to an idea of just like you roll, basically, conceptually, it's a dice roll. And that's what, you know, the majority of, um, uh, random algorithmic music that you hear about is based on some idea of you roll the dice and you find the value and that value has some kind of a meaning. And I guess if you really mind the, to go back down into the Western, uh, the European history hole, um, kind of the original moment where someone had this idea of recombining different things kind of like in a haphazard ad hoc way uh, was Raymond Lull and uh, the Ars Magna in the beginning of the 14th century. And what this was supposed to be, it was part of a big device about Christian theology, about how to make arguments about, you know, Christian stuff. Um, and, but it's, it's two circles that can be conceptually rotated, concentric circles that can be rotated. So the outer circle can be rotated and has all these words on it, and the inner circle can be rotated and has all these words on it. And any, two, any combination of two words, you can make a theological argument um, based on God. <laughs> but this is a big, this is called after the fact combinatorics. And combinatorics, the idea of just like, there's this, there's that, you combine them, you can recombine them with anything, everything's kind of a uniform chunk of information that can be recombined arbitrarily. This is supposed to be the sort of um, initial moment of that. Lulian circle, apparently they call it. Um, and I'm just gonna jump right into this quote because I think it's so funny. We're now, this kind of lands us to like, how do you recombine? Well, we're kind of in the domain of probability now. Um, so this is a quote that apparently is not totally true or spot on, but I think captures a sentiment well. 
Um, this is uh, Poiss Poisson writing in the 19th century about events of the mid 17th century. A problem about games of chance proposed to an austere Jansenist by a man of the world was the origin of the calculus of probabilities. Um, so I'm gonna just unpack that a little bit because <laughs> that's written in 19th century language. Games of chance is gambling, it's gambling with dice. Um, austere Jansenist, uh, basically think of that as like a math nerd who thinks gambling is a sin. Um, and man of the world is like a rich bad boy, AKA the Duke of Rouenez, um, AKA the Chevalier de Mere, because he called himself Chevalier because he thought of himself as a knight. So again, it's a problem about games of chance proposed to an austere Jansenist by a man of the world was the origin of the calculus of probabilities. And um, yeah, that austere Jansenist was Pascal. Um, and he kind of started, he was asked to kind of figure out, asked by um, the Duke of Rouenez to kind of figure out how he could improve his odds of winning a dice game. And this kind of led to the idea of like, well, what are the, what's the percent chance? Well, if you have two dice and you do roll it this many times, what are the chance? And then so on and so on until what become, you know, the underpinning of statistics, of economic theory, of anything involving probability or forecasting in the future based on quantitative data, it goes really deep. Just remember that gambling is at the root of it. And gambling is ancient. Gambling's been around for thousands of years, throwing little funny sheep bones and stuff like that, and, and, and attaching really high stakes to them. And, and you know, as in the next part of this talk, I kind of want to start moving into what does it really mean to engage with chance? There's gambling where you decide, okay, there's something that neither of us controls. Since neither of us controls it, we can put a bet on it, and one of us will win and one of us will lose. And, and you know, I take that bet, and you know, it's, it's, that's fun. It's fun because it's unexpected, but it's kind of dangerous also, and that's kind of fun. Um, and there are other ways of looking at chance that I'll, that I'll get to shortly. Um, I really love this image. Uh, so there's a story that Mozart made a, a musikalisches Würfenspiel, which is like a musical dice game, and you roll the dice, and again, it's super combinatoric. Recombine the different chunks of music, and it always fits together. This is a 1991 version for Atari that somebody made. Um, there's no proof that Mozart actually did it. Someone might have just slapped his name on it, but that's, that's cool, that's fine. Um, but the, the idea is, yeah, it's just like these even pieces. And then to jump forward again, this is the Componium um, in 1821 where you take these ideas and like make a machine of it. Like this is a machine of brass cogs and wheels that has, I forget, like 81 pieces of pre-composed music and some kind of aleatoric, that's a dice-based thing, way of, of randomly selecting them and just DJing from one to the next back and forth. And I'll read this um, uh, review of a performance in Paris in 1824. The instrument was left to follow its own inspirations. The applause was loud and unanimous, and some exclaimed that it was altogether miraculous. Um, but we, of course, know it's, it's a machine. It's not, it's not a miracle. It's not actually thinking. It's, it's brass. Um, but that's fun. Like, it's a fun, it's a fun um, illusion, um, fun little bit of trickery. Um, and to keep going with the machine angle nowadays, I don't know, is Alex here? No, okay, no, I'm gonna stop calling people out. But these are two fun, really, really fun apps um, that uh, play with Euclidean, uh, or Euclidean sequencers, which don't involve randomness per se, at least that I know of in these apps, but um, basically let you kind of set up notes in complicated enough uh, and interesting ways. And um, the above sequencer is a, is a radial circular sequencer, and the below one is, is Fugue Machine, which basically you enter some notes and you have multiple playheads going back and forth. They produce really sophisticated, surprising, fun kinds of things. Um, by just being geometrically sophisticated, and don't even have to be random. And, and yeah, there's still a lot of fun that can be had there. So um, for uh, Patter, where I landed was um, on this kind of random, this is how you select, uh, or how you define probabilities, and it's based on a normal distribution where you control the mean and the deviation, and um, actually, did I, I close live? You know, I'm not gonna switch tabs more than I have to because it always goes wonky. Um, but you can uh, control the width of the randomness, uh, which is like deviation, and the means you can slide it around. So if this is controlling, for instance, um, notes on, you know, which pitch on a piano, if it's all the way on the left and it's just one bar, you get the low notes, and all the way on the right, one bar, you get high notes and spread it around. Um, you can watch the video for more thing. Oh, and anybody in the room who uses Ableton Live and would like, uh, uh, anybody who's like here in, the, in these four walls wants a, uh, a free copy, just come find me. Because <laughs> um, I just want to share it, you know, I just want to get it out there. This is my sales strategy. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But anyway, you can't really talk about um, randomness in music uh, without addressing, or in the 20th century, without addressing like the big, you know, the big thing in the room, um, which is John Cage and the I Ching. Um, for those who don't know, the I Ching is the Chinese book of changes. Um, it was kind of a source of divination, and, and this is kind of what I mean when I say, you know, the origins of our, of our mathematical idea of randomness are in gambling and, and predicting gambling and trying to win at gambling. Um, but there are other, you know, ways of using chance operations that, are, that resonate on a much deeper spiritual level. And this is, you know, I Ching is like the oracle that you consult when you need to know um, what, uh, you know, what you want to do in your life. And uh, actually, I'll give one more shout out. Those are my parents sitting there, and they introduced me to the I Ching, and I've used it whenever I have a big life decision. So, thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, but basically, there are 64 possible images, and you roll the dice. Well, once upon a time, you had to get a bunch of yarrow sticks and break them and count them and blah, blah, blah. Um, but now you roll the dice, or you roll, flip your coins, and you determine your, your, your images. And each of these images has like a, a, a literary kind of quality. This image apparently is from Leibniz's, the mathematician, 18th century mathematician's uh, copy of the I Ching. And you can see, do I have a cursor here? Ah, oh, it doesn't give me a cursor. Okay, well, all the way in the upper left, you see that little O, the little zero? He, he hand numbered in, in Arabic numerals all the different things, because otherwise it was just in Chinese, and I guess that wasn't good enough. I love that he did a zero, um, zero indexed array on that. <laughs> he did not have to do that. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, in the way that John Cage used that, there was uh, kind of, the impulse was to free the self from the kind of confines of the ego. Um, this is really like a very 1950s, 1960s kind of post-war impetus. Like, you know, World War II is horrific and, and very ego-driven in every possible way. And, you know, a lot of the music that comes right after that is just sort of like, how do we just like let go of all that, like having to control? Um, and there's certainly uh, quite a politics to it. Oh, I lost my cursor. There it is. Um, there's certainly a politics to it. And I, I like this quote. This is from Christian Wolff, um, who was kind of the teenage prodigy um, in the 40s and 50s when Cage and his circle of New York composers were doing this stuff. And, and Christian Wolff, who's um, the child of German book publishers, uh, gave John Cage his first copy of the I Ching. So that's why it's significant. And I... Uh, Cage has quoted this, and I've seen it quoted elsewhere, but this is Christian Wolff writing a piece in a magazine in 1958 about, um, the piece was called New and Electronic Music. The music exists simply in the sounds we hear, given no impulse by expressions of self or personality. It is indifferent in motive, originating in no psychology, nor in dramatic intentions, nor in literary or pictorial purposes. For at least some of these composers, then, the final intention is to be free of artistry and taste. Um, I think that's beautiful, and you know, I'm just not going to add any more, attach any more to that. So, given this kind of idea of uh, how to um, think about making a computer version of all of this, like, what does that mean? Like, why, well, why do we need to do that? Why can't we just all get in a room together um, and and make music together? Um, but I think what's interesting about making computer versions is that it, you have to make a model of your idea of the real world thing. Um, and you have to model your own processes. Um, one academic, I uh, read Arna, Arna, Professor Arna Eigenfeld refers to it as autoethnography, <laughs> which is like an ethnography of the self. You look at your own musical practices and try to like download those into rules. And you can look at uh, social and dynamic practices, and this is where a lot of the research is now. And you know, when, when jazz improvisers look at each other in the eye and sync up, or kind of cue each other, do that, or, or it's totally free improv, and you're just like feeling it out as a group, I mean, that's a magical, deeply embedded social phenomenon. <laughs> you say, why would you make a computer version? Well, you know, we find out what matters to you when you make the computer version of it. So um, this image is, I couldn't find the exact date or specifics, but this is the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, which is a group in Chicago in the 60s, very kind of free improv, they still exist. Um, I was lucky enough at CalArts to get to study with Wadada Leo Smith, who still performs, and he's great, and um, definitely teaches like a, like a Zen master. Um, in a very kind of like, lots of, lots of riddles. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of modeling this on the computer, I, I soon found myself um, looking at, and this is just kind of a random example, but this idea of multi-agent systems, um, which were initially, uh, I think initially just kind of a way of modeling things like economic behavior, any kind of system where you can think of each person, a bunch of people as agents, and each agent is, you know, rational and self-interested, which is, you know, 
probably BS, but anyway, it's some way of thinking about like how, how groups behave, if, assuming everybody's identical, which they're not. Um, but it's kind of fun in this. There is Arna Eigenfeld has done a lot of research in this. Um, he's up in British Columbia. Um, and I got really inspired and I read a ton of papers from people doing this. I didn't encounter a lot of the music, so I don't really know what it sounds like what people are making, but they're making these kinds of systems like, oh, musical agent is playing a note and traveling in this direction. Oh, if it hits another musical agent, they'll do a specific thing and then travel in other directions. And, um, and you know, at the extremes of, I don't know exactly what Zanaka's had on his mind when he was <laughs> making <laughs> scores like this of like, but this is, you know, this is like a flocking algorithm. It's a way of thinking of a social behavior. Maybe not a human social behavior, but maybe just a way of like, if every instrument has some specific way they act under specific circumstances and you hit go, you get, you know, emergence. So I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Um, those are kind of the big, Things that fed into it. I just realized I forgot to close the loop on this. Um, in Patter, the way it worked out is I didn't do any complex social behaviors where things travel around in space. That's where a lot of the research is. I um, ended up just making it so uh, different instances of Patter within a live set can follow each other. Um, so it's pretty much it's what you'd call in um, graph theory. Any computer science people? <laughs> yes. What is it? A directed cyclic graph um, because. You have a bunch of little nodes and they point to each other and they're allowed to make loops. And that's a lot of the fun of Patter, honestly, is the looping because you generate all these off-kilter things. If you just hit play and let it go forever, it patters on, which is kind of the pun in the, uh, in the name of the software. Um, but if you get it, make it a little like off-kilter loop and then make a couple of them and overlay them and do polyrhythms and it's a lot of fun. And I'm gonna end with a musical sample. Um, so there's that. Um, but before I close, I kind of want to go to um, just some, some more kind of thoughts about how randomness is perceived or how randomly generated music as in timeline media, like not necessarily like randomly generated art on the wall, but music is perceived. Um, does anybody know this screen cap? Yeah! This is like the mythical Autechre Max Patch or I don't know, one of these classic ones. <laughs> um, and I have an Autechre quote to go with it. This is Sean Booth in 2004. It seems that for a lot of people, if they hear something that doesn't sound regular, they assume it's random. If live musicians were playing it, they'd probably call it jazz or something. But the fact that it's coming out of a computer, as they perceive it, somehow seems to make it different. <laughs> I think it's really funny. So it's like, because Autechre is, you know, I definitely got into this stuff because of Confield, which came out in 2001, and maybe go like, oh my gosh, you can make a computer do that? Like, I was 18 or 19, and I was just thrilling. Um, but to think that a lot of that stuff in retrospect wasn't random, like what, does that change? I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, and there's also another quote going in the other direction. So that's people hearing non-random stuff and thinking it's random. And then the other direction, there's a study you can do where you ask someone to generate, you know, 100 random, 100 coin tosses in a row. And people um, who know about such things will be able to tell the actually random ones from the ones that the person thought up. Because a person, if you, someone asked you to do that, you probably wouldn't come up with 20 heads in a row. You'd probably think, what are the chances? That's not really gonna happen. But it happens all the time. And um, true randomness is really kind of wild and, and, and volatile. And so in, the, in a Radiolab episode about this, Jad Abumrad says, that's the thing about randomness. Real randomness, when you see it, just doesn't feel random enough. I really like that. Um, and so I'm gonna close with, uh, in my blurb I kind of mentioned this Brian Eno quote um, that I think is interesting because it kind of makes this parallel to gardening which I think is apt uh, to an extent because you are kind of inviting some unexpected things but it would be more like making generative art is more like gardening where like you invented soil and you invented <laughs> mulch and you invented <laughs> sunlight and you invented, because it's a, it's a very closed system and it's a, it's a parameter space that you can really get a stranglehold on. Um, but uh, Brian Eno, nevertheless, last year said, and, and I think it's a beautiful idea, and it's certainly an ideal to work with. Imagine that composing could be something more like gardening than like architecture. You make some choices, you plant them, and then they grow. But of course, you don't control precisely how they grow. In fact, that's the excitement of gardening, that things happen in ways you don't expect. I apologize, I rushed. I wanna give it, I wanna introduce this before I play it. Just a little one minute piece I made a, a while back. Um, and it's all patter. I decided to do an every day for the month of October. I made every day a piece with patter. Um, and uh, 
except for the repeating chords, which are just kind of like an anchor, but just listen to the drum, the drums changing over time, and that's kind of a fun randomness thing, I think. <laughs> Thank you.